how many people are fucking this up when it comes to their pricing model because I think they just don't know and this little shift that they can make is going to book them more clients because right now they're making this mistake and it is losing them clients. The clients are ghosting them after they get that quote through and I know why, so let's fix it. <laughs> talk to you guys about business pricing models so this is going to be a bit of a conversation around that because I feel like people are getting really really confused and one of the key areas where I've seen my clients get a little bit stuck over the past few months is they're losing potential clients when it comes to that quoting process because they're giving too many different pricing models to the client that it detracts from what they're trying to do it becomes confusing overwhelming and then the client makes a logical decision in their brain based on information and it's not that they don't agree with the sell the value that this client has proposed it's not that they don't want the service it's just it was communicated in a way where their brain did the maths and it didn't quite work out so i want to talk about that today so there's a bunch of different pricing models for your business and I think this is a really important conversation. I have always been the person who wants you to have multiple streams of income. I want for my clients, I want there to be a way that they have bulk cash lump sums come into their business. That's their profit and I want there to be a reoccurring revenue as well. So we're always focused on creating more streams of income into your business but there is a way to do it smart intentionally and that is layered so you're not confusing your audience and your clients and your customers at the same time. So let's talk about it. So the first one we're going to talk about is hourly rates. This is basically just charging for the work based on an hourly rate. So for example, my husband, he is a mechanic. He charges per hour or the labor for the work that he does. So if a client comes in for a service and it's going to take two hours, plus the parts that are needed. There's two sections on the invoice. There is the parts section, and then there is the labor that it took him those two hours to do. So he's billing by the hour, and that's important to know. We're gonna run that model. When it comes in, do you have a profitable hourly billing rate so that you can actually bring people in underneath you? For example, his rate when he went up to a workshop and he's putting on staff has to look a little bit different to the rate when he was just working for himself. So that's kind of the hourly rate. It's a little bit unpredictable, I think, in this sense, because some of the projects that he gets, people ask for a quote and he's like, yep, this should take, th it should take three hours. And when they get in there, in fact, he may not have the right tooling for it. So the project extends out on his dollar, on his pocket. He doesn't get to charge the customer because he's in the right tool for it. Secondary, it can come in and the client can actually have something, a bigger problem. And so it's come in sometimes when a job's coming to the workshop for something really simple and he's like, yep, this is two hours. This is the quote. This is what it should be. And when he's got in there, there's actually been a big problem with the car. That means it's unsafe for the person to drive. And so he has to bill them more hours to be able to fix that. So it's actually roadworthy and safe to leave the workshop. So sometimes it's unpredictable. The final cost on the project is always a little bit hard. And I think when you're doing hourly rates and when it comes to quotes, doing quotes for people, depending on what type of industry you're in, that's the one real sticking point with that hourly type of work that can cause a little bit of friction or not objection, but hesitation with your clients. So that's just something to think of as well. I find hourly works really well. The first three years of my design business, I actually ran with just an hourly pricing model. It was like, I don't do packages, I don't do programs. It's just literally how many hours it takes me. And I think, I estimate this will take between 10 to 15 hours. Here is my rate and then we get an invoice at the end as I've shifted and been able to predict now having years of data on how long and how average the jobs take me, I have a bit more information to make a decision about packages and programs moving forward. But at the start, hourly rate was really, really important for me. All right. So the second one is project fees. This is charging a flat rate for a project. So I've got some clients who do, so they're a photographer. So the project that someone comes to them for is to shoot their experience. And then for example, then their audience is allowed to purchase the, the photos. So they're purchasing a project or something like you know, the interior design of a house. And it's a $30,000 fee for me to do the whole thing. It's whatever it is, it's very project based. This is here where though the timeline becomes the issue because if you're going, this is the project from start to finish and then the client is in greater communication, the project blows out, it takes a month to get the equipment that you need to be able to do it for the project. 
that timeline extension, how difficult the client is, all that type of stuff can factor into it where you maybe don't have the funds allocated for all that extra energy and expenditure. So I feel like that's, that's a tricky one as well. Now in my design business, I very much run with that project fee. So if you come to me for rebrand work or whatever it's going to be, designs, courses, anything you want done, there is a kind of a package price on it. And there's usually what I like to do is give two levels to it. And then I have to be very, very clear on what that entails, this amount of project management, this many touch points, this is the time frame. If it extends past that time frame, there will be extra fees. I had to be really, really careful in my construction of how that actually works to still be able to maintain a profitable model for myself. But it's a very, very good way to do it because you will find that the amount of projects that you, the project is a flat fee, the project rate, the amount of clients that come in and the project actually takes you less time because you've got good systems in place, you've got your S&P set up, you can use templates, whatever it is. If you can, in certain jobs, have a higher profit margin, it will cover maybe the one or two jobs that you get or the percentage of jobs that you get that maybe extend over the project timeline that take a little bit more energy and effort than what you were originally accounted for. So I think overall, it works out quite well with that project-based pricing. Pricing. I feel like the project-based pricing as well is a good one because it avoids people looking at how much you are per hour. And if you're in a particular industry, for example, a lot of my clients are virtual assistants and they, everyone always wants to know what the hourly rate of the virtual assistant is because in their head, they're comparing it to an overseas virtual assistant who might be seven to nine dollars. So if you're a virtual assistant and you're saying, I will complete this project for you and I will get it done super fast. And then you start talking about hourly rates, automatically people start thinking, well, that's three times as much as this VA that I can get offshore. So I think there's so much value to providing that project or that package based communication. The thing is here, I want to caveat with that. This is going to be a bigger training than I intended. Sorry. That's always what happens is that if you are going to go down this map, this method of projects and explaining it like that, you cannot also bring into it hourly conversation. So if you're going to package, like I'm going to do your logo package and it's $4,000 and you get all these inclusions in it. You don't go then and put in it. It's capped at 10 hours of work. Because then you're doing a package base, but you're like throwing in an hourly rate. And someone can very quickly go like, well, $4,000 divided by 10 hours, you're getting $400 an hour to draw me a logo. And you can see how the, the logicness in someone's brain doesn't work out. It just does not convert. And I feel like that's where a lot of people are messing up is that they are bringing in the hourly rate conversation into a project based set, if that makes sense. So I had to put my camera on charge and connect it. We'll see. I hope it's charging. It's saying I've only got four minutes left. So we'll see how we go. And the next one is retainer base fees. Once again, this is something I've used very well in my design business as well, is actually having clients on retainer. These are clients who usually have ongoing work that pops up. And basically, retainer fees are a way for you to, as a business, really make sure you've got predictable income. You can plan your calendar, you can plan your client workload and plan strategically with your income as well. But I feel like there's a second layer to that where the client can also do that on the other side and they can know. I think the main benefit for clients when they use the retainer program is that they've got someone who's ready to go. My client, my husband actually uses this in his mechanic business as well, even though the retainer conversation is not really quite common in his industry, but coming back to if you want something done, you want it done quick by someone you trust. It's that in-house, out-house kind of situation. Instead of having a lawyer in-house for your business 24-7, you have a lawyer on retainer that you can call. You're a priority client. You can they already have all the information that you need. So you get access to advice and help and support really quickly. And that's kind of how I see retainer models. It also allows them to budget for things well from a, a client perspective. And yeah, I feel like retainer works really, really well. However, it can lead to a little bit of dependency and lack of boundaries I've found as well. So my retainer clients were majority of them great clients, but my really, really bad clients I've had over the years, unfortunately were retainer clients who just had no boundaries. You know, were calling me at 6am in the morning, calling me at 9am at night, doing that whole, like, I need this presentation by 8am tomorrow. And I would do the presentation and they'd be like, cool, thank you. We don't actually do it for three weeks now. Just like a complete lack of boundaries and disrespect. So I feel like if you are going to do a retainer model conversation, you just have to be really, really clear on your boundaries, the way that you communicate and how you set things up for yourself. So we're back. Figured out the problem. Format the SD card. Wasn't that it was running flat. Anyway, I'm learning. New camera, new thing. So let's talk about value-based pricing. And if you want to run a value-based pricing business model, 
you really see this most common in spaces like mentoring and things like that. A lot of those online celebrity influencers where you pay $100,000 for two phone calls with them. It's basically the idea that the price is based on the perceived value that someone gets from the service, the product, the offering, whatever it is. It's a little bit murky waters sometimes. The price is often higher because people need to pay more to value the service. And I've had this in a couple of instances in my business, specifically when I was working with women who were paying, who were making more than multi-million dollars a year. And my prices were low enough. They were excited to work with me and they valued me as a person, but the price was not high enough to make them actually remember to show up on the calls. You know what I mean? Like they were making so much money. They were so successful that my rates were pretty much like chump change to them. They didn't even often most of the time know how much they were actually paying me because the invoice just went to their team. Someone else just paid it, whatever it was. And they came back. And so they were always forgetting calls. They were forgetting to show up. They didn't like use the service in the way that I felt comfortable providing the service. So there's a lot to be said for value-based pricing models. I feel like a lot of people do this wrong though. They use it wrong. They don't understand that you've actually got to have the value to back it up. And that you have to be able to, you can't just throw value-based pricing into something that doesn't have the perceived value already there, that your audience doesn't understand, that your audience isn't willing to pay for value-based pricing. There's a whole other piece to that story, but that's what it is. If you're seeing people online charging exorbitant amounts for something, it is because there are people who do value that and they will pay that. It doesn't mean that your audience will pay that as well. So just keep that in mind. The performance-based fees in the next one. This is kind of like your real estate agents, event planners, what am I thinking of? Sales, that type of thing. Marketing, if you've got a particular campaign, you might be charging a percentage of the campaign overall. That basically your pricing comes down to the, the profit that has been made or the result that has been had and you take a commission based on that. So this model can be incredibly lucrative. It can be, but at the same point, it can be incredibly risky, especially if you're in a situation where you don't have 100% control over the outcome. If it's like a group project in high school, isn't it? You can put your best foot forward, but if someone else doesn't lift their weight, doesn't pull it, doesn't present the oral presentation properly, you can lose points and it can affect your grade and in this case, your income. So there's a couple of caveats with that. If you're going to do this kind of performance-based fee, you have to make sure that you have the ability to, del to deliver, that you have enough control of the situation to be able to ensure that you've got the correct level of income from it, and also that you have clear boundaries on what actually is the benchmark, what is the success that we are trying to reach, and that that is communicated across both sides, because you will have that situation of, you believe you've done everything to achieve it, this is what I've done, this is the commission rate for it, and the client can turn around and go, that wasn't because of you. I would have got the success anyway. I'm not paying you. So there's a certain a bigger piece to that, but that is essentially when it comes down to that performance-based pricing. The next one is one that you guys know I'm very comfortable with, very confident in, and that is subscription-based pricing models. And this is a way to provide regular, reoccurring, reoccurring, sustainable, scalable, often income into your business. It's a little bit different from retainer fees as well. So subscription-based is really where it's a reoccurring fee for access to a service product, education, community, support, whatever it's going to be. Clients pay a monthly fee or an annual fee to be able to access that. It's great for providing that reoccurring revenue. However, the flip side is that your retention rate can be the sticking point, especially if you're charging something monthly. If you don't have a way of ensuring that value is delivered every single month, ensuring that they feel like, yes, I've got my value this month, for a payment, it's really easy for people to go like, oh, I haven't watched Netflix in two months, I'll cancel my subscription. So your retention rate, even though lower subscription-based models, for example, monthly, is really good at getting people in the door, you will notice a higher level of conversions offering that option. The retention is less than if you got someone to pay up front, work with you over 12 months, and then at 12 months when it came time to re-sign, look at back and like collectively look at all the growth they've had over 12 months versus this month's month subscription model. So the retention rate will be lower, your churn rate will be higher, and you do have to factor that in when you're looking at subscription-based fees. But I do always believe that majority of businesses I speak to should always, it's not always the case in everyone because it's always so different, their goals, their audiences, the service they provide, how they want to run their business, their personality styles, but I do believe it's a great way to leverage your time and create a more solid foundation. If you've got lump pieces of cash coming in, lump sum payment checks, if you're doing project based, hourly based, all that type of thing, if you've got one different format of getting money into your business, adding a subscription 
membership, anything like that into it is just like a secondary layer of protection for yourself. However, it does take work. Everything in business takes work. So that's just that to be mindful of well. So overall, that is hourly rates, project fees, retainer fees, value-based fees, performance-based fees, and subscription-based fees. So that's kind of all the different ones that I'm currently seeing and working with with clients. Here's where I see the majority of people go wrong when it comes to this pricing model conversation is that they've listened to someone online who said you need to move to project you need to do these packages or maybe they're found in their self. They're looking at the work that they're doing and they're like, yep, it should be projects, should be packages. I want to be able to offer a package for someone so that we get less bogged down in the hourly rate conversation. And I'm like, I agree. That's a great step to go to. And what they miss is the conversation where they send out a quote to someone and it's based on packages. And then there's a little blind in there that says, this is for 20 hours or this guarantees you 10 hours, or they bring the hourly conversation into it. People are smart. People can do maths really, really quickly. I especially see this in the VA industry where they'll look at it and go, well, if I'm paying $4,000 for you to do that service for me, but then you've put on there that that's for roughly 10 hours, that means I'm paying $400 an hour when I can get an offshore VA to do that for me for $7 an hour. So if you're going to do project-based packaging, if you're going to do project-based, value-based, if you're going to do any of those models where it is a lump sum, you just don't bring the hourly conversation into it. The hour rate does not come into the chat. We are not talking about that. It does not enter the zone, right? And likewise, if you've got subscription-based models, you're keeping the hourly conversation out of it. If you're going to be hourly, just be fucking hourly. And then if you're going to do something else, do something else. Just don't merge those. Don't bring the language of different versions of pricing models into each other when you're trying to pitch again new clients it just ends up messy clunky and with people kind of very quickly doing the math in their head and realizing that that's probably not the way that they're going to go and results in not booking the clients that you really want to so each pricing model has pros and cons it does they're all they all work they all have pros and cons it's just going to depend on you on your business on your industry on your goals your lifestyle your personality what you want to do with your business and how you want to structure it there's a lot of different factors come into it but i hope at least this is giving you a little bit more information on how it all works the different options that you've got the fact that there is different options and which ones maybe don't work so well together or which ones really do i'm excited to continue the conversation if you have any more questions reach out let's know